perhaps if you've been following the series currently on The Science Show, you'll have heard our guest tonight investigating his tiny honey possums with Lynn Malcolm. Don Bradshaw is a professor of zoology at the University of Western Australia, and he's also wonderfully well informed on the wines of WA and the French history of southwest Australia. Anyway, the series on The Science Show is called Balancing Nature and it goes to various natural hotspots in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. But this one, where we find Lynn and Don Bradshaw, is out west, a place where biodiversity and the sheer range of species is immense. Well, I suppose you'd have to say of all of the marsupials, uh, it's probably the most unusual. Firstly, because of its size, it's very, very tiny. The fully grown adult weighs about 9 to 10 grams, the, the males. The females are a little bit larger, 11 to 12 grams. The males are unique in the sense that they have the largest testes relative to their body size of any mammal. So their testes are about 4.2% of their body mass. You equate that to a human and you'd have testes of about 5 kilograms. <laughs> doesn't uh, bear thinking about. <laughs> it doesn't. They also have the largest sperm of any mammal. They're very long tails. We think this uh, means that they're very efficient swimmers in terms of getting up to fertilise the, the female's egg. The other thing about the honey possum is that it's not closely related to any other marsupial in Australia. This has been confirmed by recent DNA studies and its closest relative now is a small possum-like animal, a thing called Dromesiops, living in South America. And this is the only one left alive. So it brings up in stark evidence, if you like, of the link between South America and Australia, which goes back to this large supercontinent Gondwanda. And Gondwanda, that, that southern continent split up, started 120 million years ago. Australia um, split off about 60 million years ago and started to raft northwards. So from about 50 to 60 million years ago, the honey possum, or its, whatever its relative was, was isolated from uh, the South American marsupials, but they've re retained this, uh, this DNA linkage. So the marsupial honey possum would be one of the oldest uh, lineages of all of the marsupials. That's reflected in the fact that it shows a number of extreme adaptations to its unusual diet. It lives entirely on pollen and nectar from flowers, so it's the only non-flying mammal that's totally reliant on flowers. So in that sense, it's a, it's a strange animal, and uh, it's very much localised, if you like, in these heathlands, uh, which used to spread from Durian Bay in the north to Islite Bay in the east. And these are the so-called Quangan heathlands, which are dominated by Banksia trees. And Banksia, of course, is the, the primary food source of, of the honey possum, the Banksia species. This whole group of plants, they're all, again, Gondwanda relics. And uh, they provided a, an enormously rich source of plant material and associated biodiversity in which the honey possums are found. Their numbers have declined, of course, with mainly the loss of their habitat. Farmers, unfortunately, always saw banksias as being rubbish trees and pushed them over or burnt them. And the banksias, of course, always grew on the poorer soil. That has another positive, though. It means that some of the, the really poor soils were never taken up for farming. And where we are at the moment, down in Scott National Park, that, again, is an area that was very marshy, low-lying, and obviously not suitable for agriculture. And as a result of that, it's now a national park. And so some of this unique habitat has been preserved for the honey possum. So why are you studying this honey possum? It's not actually on the endangered list, is it? No, I've done a bit of work on other endangered species, the Western Swamp Tortoise and uh, Gilbert's Potteroo, for example. And what you find is that you're extremely restricted in what you can do because the an animal is so endangered, uh, you can't really carry out any sort of procedures with them that might threaten their long-term survival. When we started working on the Western Swamp Tortoise, for example, there were estimated to be only a dozen animals left alive. It was Australia's most uh, endangered vertebrate and the world's most endangered colonian or, or tortoise or turtle. So, for example, even up until today, we've never taken blood from these animals, which you would normally do. You just can't risk it on an animal like that. But the honey possum was an animal which we could see was going to get on the endangered list because of the loss of its habitat. There's a whole series of threatening processes which are making life very difficult for animals that are living these, in these sorts of Banksia-dominated uh, woodlands. And we thought that it would be very interesting to study an animal before it gets to that critical stage to see what one could do in terms of developing a set of prescriptions which would ensure that its habitat 
habitat was protected. And it also just happened by chance. We um, bought a block of land down here and uh, we used to drive through the Scott National Park to get to our block and I was wondering what was there so I got a permit to trap on the park and we discovered there were honey possums. No one actually knew that they were here. And so what started out as a little bit of a hobby, we put some traps in, we started catching them. We started the usual things that you do as a zoologist. You, you mark the animals, you weigh them, you, you look at when they're breeding and things like that. We then started to, to look more closely at the diet. Everyone knew that they fed on nectar and, and pollen. The difficult thing was to see if you could measure how much that they did. And that took us about five or six years. Uh, we developed a, a method which was based on the use of isotopes. They are modified forms of the normal elements like oxygen and uh, hydrogen and uh, sodium. And the isotopes exist in a, in a series of forms. Some are stable, like the nitrogen isotope, the heavy isotope nitrogen-15 is a stable isotope. Others, like the isotope of um, sodium, are radioactive. The isotopes are basically different forms of the elements that have extra neutrons pushed into their nucleus, and the extra neutrons make them unstable. And generally what they do is they radiate off energy in the form of radiation, and they transform themselves back to the stable form. The advantage is that you can inject these or you can feed these to animals. As far as the animal's concerned, they're exactly the same as the real thing, but you can actually monitor it. You can measure the change in concentration. And uh, we developed a fairly complicated system whereby we would catch our animal, we'd inject it with a cocktail of these isotopes, take a very tiny blood sample and then we'd let it go. <laughs> and We'd let it go back where we first caught it and then we would hope that we would catch it again in 24 to 48 hours. All we would do then is just reweigh it and take a second drop of blood from it. And from those two blood samples that we took, we were able to then monitor the change in concentration of the oxygen, as well as the other isotopes that we put in there. And this enabled us to measure the, what we call the field metabolic rate. It's a rate at which they're turning over oxygen. So oxygen is really the, the currency of life, if you like. The faster you turn it over, the faster your metabolism is, and the more food you need, of course. And once we were able to measure the rate of oxygen turnover, at the same time we were turn it, measuring the rate of water turnover through uh, using tritium, that's a radioactive form of hydrogen, and uh, we therefore knew their total energy budget. The tricky thing then was to break it down into nectar and pollen. Each time we catch an animal, we brush the snout of the animal with a little block of agar and then melt that under, the, under a microscope slide and we can see the pollen from the flowers that it's poked its nose into. So we know which flower it's been feeding on. We would then go out and collect the nectar ourselves from the flower and measure the concentration of sugar and sodium in that nectar. So once we've worked out exactly how much nectar they're taking in, and we also know how much energy there is in nectar because it's 20% sugar, then we take that total amount of energy away from their daily field metabolic rate and the rest of the energy could only come from pollen. There's no other source. <laughs> and again, knowing how much energy is in pollen, we could work out the pollen. So um, it's sort of like a house of cards. It's based on a whole series of assumptions. But we're very confident in the data we got. And uh, we can say that a 9-gram honey possum will take in about 7 mils or 7 grams of nectar per day and 1 gram of pollen. So about 8 grams for a 9-gram animal. So really they need their, almost their own body weight per day. This is why they're so vulnerable because all that comes from fresh flowers and they must have flowers you know, every day, if you like, to stay alive. And uh, this is why they're very vulnerable to things like fires. If fires go through, as well as killing the animals, it, it knocks plants back. And it takes a long time for the environment to come back. So it's very critical if there are fires that they're localised and they're patchy and there are areas that don't get burnt because that's, that's where the animals will actually um, survive. So the key is to really maintain the habitat? It is. Originally, I suppose, when we started working on reproduction of different animals, marsupials, I started on uh, reproduction of the quokka, and um, Felicity came and, and did a master's degree with me, and we were interested in looking at the, the reproductive system in the marsupials. And at that stage, many of the marsupials were becoming rarer and rarer, and many people sort of thought, well, they've, there's something wrong with their reproductive physiology, and that's why we started looking. But in, in actual fact, there's nothing wrong with them. All of the animals we looked at, even the most endangered ones, like the Gilbert's Potteroo, their reproductive system is fine. The problem is their preferred habitat is to declining and uh, the obvious things like clearing of vegetation are totally destructive of the environment but there are other things like the spread of dieback the gerodieback which is a phytophthora cinnamoni 
It's a fungus-like plant pathogen which attacks the roots of many, many species of plants. Now, unfortunately, things like the Proteaceae and the Myrtaceae, they're very, very vulnerable. And these are the Gondwanda families of plants on which the honey possum relies. So here's another threatening process which is killing things like Banksias. The Banksias are dying very rapidly. Every field trip we come down here to Scott National Park, we see two or three, four more trees that have died as a result of the Phytophthora. So that's, that's destroying their prime food source. We find that if we do a plot, where we plot, we graph the number of animals that we capture versus the number of flowers on, on the uh, Banksia elicifolia tree, the holly leaf Banksia, we get a very nice correlation between the two, showing the more flowers there are, the more honey possums we catch. So we're sure that that's their primary source of food. There's a nice pelican going past there. Yes, having a lovely <laughs> evening cruise across the water. <laughs> And uh, there are a variety of, of threatening processes. The global warming is really a problem because rainfall has declined about 15% in the southwest corner. All of the models, I don't know why, but they all seem to focus on the southwest corner of Western Australia as being one of the areas which is going to have a declining rainfall. And certainly over the period that we've been here, so the, the last 20 years, there's been a marked drop-off of, of the rainfall. But that, of course, means that water tables are likely to decline and that's going to have an impact on the banksias, which are not really very deeply rooted trees, and dropping water tables would, would have a major impact. People don't realise, I think, the, how sensitive this southwest corner is. It's as a result of the work of a group of Oxford ecologists, Norman Myers is, is one of the main ones. They've identified in all over the world 34 biodiversity hotspots which are under threat. That means that their habitat is changing rapidly to the detriment of that biodiversity group. And this southwest corner is the only one in Australia. To give you an idea of the, uh, the richness down here, no one really knows how many native species of plants are here. The estimates at the moment vary between five to 7,000 species of plants, but of those species, somewhere between 49 and 53 percent are endemic. That means that they don't occur anywhere else in the world. So it's a major hotspot. If you go and look at the vertebrates, the animals as well, you've seen the same sort of picture. There's 456 species of vertebrates listed here. A hundred of these are endemic to the region. And these include 19 species of birds, seven mammals, 50 reptiles, 24 amphibians, and eight species of freshwater fish. Five of the bird species are listed as threatened under the, under the EPBC Act, for example. They include things like Carnaby's black cockatoo, the Bodan's black cockatoo, the noisy scrub bird, western whip bird, western bristle bird, etc., etc. We're very fortunate to have this extraordinary biodiversity here in the southwest, and it's really up to us whether it survives or it doesn't. We're concerned about proposals for development. Uh, development can occur and be compatible with, with conservation, but it needs to be done in a, in a very sensitive sort of way. And uh, this is, I think, what the message that we would like to try and get across to governments and to the bodies such as the DEC and the EPA. So I guess at times, though, you might have difficulty in convincing governments and bodies to put a lot of resource into saving, for example, this tiny little possum. I mean, what does it matter and how do you convince the relevant bodies that it matters? Well, I suppose the, the funding that we've had for the honey possum was, not, was never anything to do with its conservation. You could only get funding for an animal that was already declared. Otherwise, I think there's just so much competition nowadays to get research funding. The money that we've had is, is because we've been doing this rather sophisticated physiology on them, trying to work out their diet, developing new technologies. We were using Lucas Heights over in Sydney, which is the nuclear research establishment for the analysis of all our samples, because we could, they couldn't be analysed any other way. We were using nuclear, prompt nuclear reactions to analyse O18, for example. So in that sense, it probably was attractive to funding bodies because it was innovative and in developing new approaches and new techniques. The other thing that we're also funded for, we started to look at their reproductive physiology. And although we could take a couple of drops of blood from these animals, you could never take enough blood to measure changes in, say, levels of progesterone or estradiol. But what we found, or we didn't discover ourselves, it was found by others, but what we exploited was the fact that they excrete steroid hormones, sex hormones in their feces. 
so that, in fact, the concentration of progesterone is far, far higher in the faeces than it is in the plasma. And these things produce tiny amounts of faecal material, say 100 milligrams a day. And if you can collect that, it's loaded with sex hormones. So we, we were able to monitor the changes in these hormones over time. And we've been able to discover a lot about its physiology and particularly its reproductive physiology. The thing that's interesting about the honey possums is that, like the kangaroos, they also have this thing called embryonic diapause. Um, what happens is when they give birth, the female mates straight after they give birth and that fertilizes another embryo. But that embryo um, remains in a form of stasis inside the uterus of the female while she has one lactating in the pouch. And it's the process of lactation which inhibits the development of that second young. And what happens if, for example, they, the young in the pouch is lost, then that second embryo, it's not really an embryo, it develops to what's called a blastocyst stage. It's just a hollow ball of cells, and it sits there. And if the young in the pouch is lost, then that blastocyst starts to develop, and away it goes, and she gives birth to another young without having to mate with a male. So uh, when we started this work, it was thought that the, the reproduction of the honey possum was really so different. It was more or less put in a separate category on its own. But what we've found is that it really shows a mix of all of the reproductive styles of all of the other marsupials. And this fits perhaps with the fact that they're this extremely ancient lineage, which is not specialised except in terms of its, uh, of its diet. So that work that's been done with a number of our PhD students has uh, given us a lot more insight into the reproduction of the animal as well. So how would you summarise what's been learnt about conservation of biodiversity from your particular work on this honey possum? I guess it's really very simple, just preserve the habitat. If you can preserve the habitat that the animal requires and you can stop it being degraded or, or whatever, then there's no problem with the animals. They'll, they'll hang on quite easily. The western swamp tortoise is a classic case, for example. It's found in a peculiar type of clay soil which is used to make sewage pipes. <laughs> and so almost every bit of that clay soil around the Perth area has been dug up and turned into sewage pipes. There's very little left. There's only, there's only one little small reserve. So although we've been very successful in getting them to breed and we've we've released you know well over a couple of hundred um, juvenile swamp tortoises now into the wild, there's nowhere else to release them. This is a major problem and so we're trying now to find places where they might be able to survive. But it really is a simple message. There's no, there's nothing magical about it. Um, there's nothing wrong with the animals. All that's happened is they've lost a place to live and that's really as a result of us unfortunately. So you've spent many years on this animal and a number of other animals. You must have a lot of passion. Can you attempt to describe that passion and why you are so passionate about this? I, I suppose I'm not really what you'd call a standard zoologist <laughs> in the sense of the word. I, I, mean, I was always interested in um, looking at you know the world around one, but I was going to be a research chemist. Like a lot of people, I was stimulated by a good teacher at school. I did zoology as a sort of soft option. At school I'd done biology and it was, it was a very easy subject, an interesting subject, but I literally did it as a result of that. And I have to say the first year I found it excruciatingly boring. And it was really only the end of the year this chap came in and sat on the bench and gave four lectures on the thing called ecology. And uh, ecology wasn't a household word. Quite obviously, I couldn't understand a word of what he said, and neither could anyone else. And he raved away, away there, and uh, it had a, a real impact on me. And I, this was the first time in my arrogant little career that he was a subject I couldn't dominate and come top of. And I thought, what I did, when I think back now, I'm horrified. I rang up the professor of zoology on a Saturday morning at his home, and this is our Harry Waring has, has, has passed away now, and I said I wanted to talk to him. So he said, come around, my boy. <laughs> so I went round to his house and I explained my problem. I said, and there's these lectures that are going on, and I said, I can't understand it, but it's obviously something there. And I said, I'd like to become an ecologist. And he said, right, well, what you have to do is you have to do physiology and biochemistry and botany and all these things. So I switched. But to me, it was a, a puzzle. And I think bright minds are attracted by disorder, not by order. And uh, you, you can get hundreds of lectures which are exquisitely put together and they're as boring as anything. And what I've done in my own career is always I give one lecture in the year to first year students 
which is pitched way above their heads, but I know it'll drag someone like me out of the audience. And I've actually had two PhD students who've come to me and said it was that lecture. <laughs> so I know it works. Now, you can't overdo this sort of thing because you end up with some terribly confused first-year students. But your very brightest students are not really interested in getting a neat story. They're interested in being given a puzzle that they can work on and they can drag it apart. And this is what happened with me. I've always been someone who's been interested in the more detailed mechanistic sides of things and applying that scientific background to animal problems. You're constantly faced with these sorts of challenges and what sort of armoury have you got? What can you do? And you have to develop new techniques. You have to develop new ways of looking at things. And it's that, I think, which is always inspired me. But again, my approach has been not to study, catch animals, take them back to the laboratory and work on them there, but to try to work on them in their actual own environment. So I've developed ecophysiology as a discipline, been rather heavily involved in developing that over the years and written books on it and whatever. And uh, you've seen my no longer mobile field laboratory that was specifically designed so that we could take the lab out into the, out of the environment and we could study animals under the circumstances which are most suitable for them rather than for us. And it has paid off because it's given us insights that we would never be able to get in any other way. It's given us a, an idea of how these animals do survive. I spent four years working on Barrow Island, which is Australia's most important A-class reserve with 14 species of mammals on the island. Eight of them are marsupials and four of those are extinct on the mainland. So it's the only place you can even see these things now. And it's absolutely pullulating with animals. You have to watch when you go out at night, you don't tread on them. We estimated there were 110,000 golden bandicoots. It's extinct on the mainland and they're just running everywhere. And the reason is their habitat's still there. Even though there's an oil field on the, on the island, my old mate Harry Butler was, was responsible for developing a, a system whereby all they did was to ensure that whenever they destroyed a, a bit of environment, that as soon as the well was capped, they restored the vegetation back to its original state. And that's all you need to do. Maintain the vegetation, the animals look after themselves. And it doesn't have to be an animal that feeds on plants, uh, like the kangaroos or so the honey possum indirectly with flowers. Insects, for example, they feed on plants, so animals that feed on insects depend on plants. Everything depends on, on plant life. And if you can manage the vegetation, the animals will look after themselves. But most of my early work, my PhD, was done on a group of desert reptiles. And that's really how I started working in the Sahara and in the North American deserts as well. So I wanted to get a global view of these animals. But I, I really think as a, if you're meant to be a, a biologist, I wouldn't even say a zoologist, you must be interested in everything, plants, animals. And so I've worked with birds and with fish and amphibians, with desert frogs and marsupials, you know, virtually everything. And e each animal, each, each thing has been a puzzle on its own. So that's really what's sustained me over the years. And OK, so we're still two years retired. We're still working. <laughs> Can't stop. And you must have developed a real affection for the honey possum. I think so. I mean, they're, they're absolutely cutest little animals. They, they really are. And the thing was, getting to know them, I think I probably mentioned I'm the only person who's been able to bleed honey possums without killing them because they are so tricky in a way. They're, they're very sensitive to high-frequency noises. Even pulling a, a tissue out of a Kleenex box can kill them. You know, they, their heart just stops with the fright. But what I found is that they're really feisty little animals, and if you handle them properly, and I've discovered when they're stressed, there's a particular little attitude that they adopt. If you see that, whatever I'm doing, I'll stop, because otherwise in 10 seconds they'll be dead. And if you hold them too tightly in your hand, for example, they'll die. But you've seen the way we hold them. We just hold them by the tail and they're fine. They're, they're great. But every animal's the same. You, you need to get to know them. And that, that's been our reason for our success. <laughs> and we're hoping that what we're finding out about them will in the long term ensure their survival. That was Lynn Malcolm in conversation with Professor Don Bradshaw of the University of Western Australia.